All righty, welcome to episode 43, or whatever you want to call it, of this group of slot car guys getting together and talking slot car stuff. I'm your host, Greg Dowd. Again, with most of our regulars, we've got Kelly, Garth, Luff, John, Mike, Wayne, Dennis, Graham, and Ray is just coming in here. He'll, he'll pop in after I'm done giving introductions. I don't see anybody new to us in the list just yet. So no introductions to do. If you're uh, if you're just coming into worldwide slot car chat, watching at a later date, you've got some catching up to do. Go watch some early, go watch some early videos, and you'll get everybody's introduction, and you'll know more than you wanted to know about most of us. <laughs> As usual, let's begin with some show and tell. John, you've already got something ready to go, so go ahead and take the floor. I do. I, I do. Get something ready. I, yeah. Okay, it's up and ready, but I have to confess, I mean, it's my show and tell, but I didn't do the work. So that's, that, there's a, a caveat for you right there. Okay, so here I'm going to uh, share, oh, I got to share a screen, right? Okay, here we go. Uh, my daughter, this is- Everybody else get something ready. You uh, my, my this, this is my daughter's latest custom build. Um, these, this, this is, these are the photos that she got from her customer of a car that he raced in, I guess the SECA. Mm -hmm. And it's a bug-eyed Sprite here. I can, I'll zoom it in a little bit if I can here. Here we go. And you can see how, uh, I mean, it's a cool looking little car. Yeah. So he, sent, he sent her two photos, this one and this one. Okay. And said, uh, please build me a custom car. So she started with the chassis. You got her soldering chassis? She, oh God, she does, she does better. Look, look at the solder joint. She, she solders better than I do. Yeah. Right. Young, young eyes and steady hands. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at that. Front so, wheel uh, drive, John. It's rear wheel drive. Yeah. It's a 030 motor. And I just, um, I took a picture to, to show you how the um, front is connected to the rear with, and actually that's speaker wire insulator. Zoom in. It does a, <laughs> it does a great job. It's yes. a great job. Zoom in on that if you could. Sure, yeah, I'm sure, no problem. Um, so that's how it's connected. This right here is um, the insulation for speaker wire. Wow, that's, that's perfect rubber link. Yeah, oh yeah, and it, it absorbs all the vibration. And, and this is actually another 030 can that's been cut that, that holds the, uh, <laughs> the, the drive shaft. Oh, that's brilliant. And then that's the uh, that's a brass um, gear on a, a plastic uh, crown. Oh yeah, the kid's got it down. She's and here's uh, her her painting. I, I, she took pictures through all the stages. So I start off with in, black interior in red, and then of course it had that yellow stripe. So she did the yellow stripe, and this is all paint. Oh. Uh -huh. And then she started detailing it. And then of course, filled in the, uh, the cracks with black paint as well. Yep. And then the, the um, silver details. There you go, that, that's, a, that's a nice shot there. And then uh, I'll just keep going here. Tell me if I'm going too quickly or not quickly enough. You know, we'll feel free to stop you. <laughs> okay, excellent. So you can see she, she did the panel lines. She does the panel lines better than I do. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Um, and then there she is with the finished car. There you go. Just before we shipped it off and sh she put a roll bar in as per the actual car. Yes. I'll give you up. And then mini he had mini lights. So she had mini lights uh, put in, but there it is on our track. With the 1960s uh, bell bubble visor that was tinted. Nice. And that, she, uh, we actually, um, I gave her, I don't know if you remember um, Rumblers from the 70s. They were the Hot Wheels motorcycle guys. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they only lasted for a year because they were a, a, a financial failure for Hot Wheels. But one of the riders had one of those bubble masks. So she basically molded it. And that's how we, that's how she created that. John, does she do the um, shut lines with uh, paint and brush or a felt tipped pen? No, that's actually it's 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 paint. It's it's black um, testers enamel washed down to uh, 
to act like it acts like a capillary action and goes right in. That's a difficult job. Yeah, even with a felt tip pen, it's a difficult job. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, exactly. Like I said, you know, young, young eyes and steady hands. It's winking at me. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. If you take a look, like, it, you know, it and did. again, she saw this on the picture. This was the air intake for the engine. <laughs> it had a little, little bit of like a, of a ram setup for the, uh, for the air. And then full interior, full driver. She even got his driver's suit with the blue stripe. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And there's there's the real car and there's the the model. Show the side view of the real car again. Oh sure. Yeah, there's a suit and a bubble. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the bell bubble and the blue stripe. Fantastic. So he's since received it and is quite pleased with it. I would have expect so. <laughs> <laughs> Very oh, nice. and the H. I, oh, t you see that he had his, his H on the side. She actually had to. She couldn't get a, a decal, so she actually hand did that as well. See the H here? Mm -hmm. That's hand painted. <laughs> there, you can see it. That's awesome. I forgot to mention that. And yeah. if you put a if you put a small ring of white dots on the tire wall, you can emulate the lettering without actually lettering. Just a dot 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 dot. Well, well, actually, I, she didn't do it, but but the, the tires that we actually um, uh, that she cast are uh, old monogram Goodyears, and she just didn't didn't have time to to paint it. Mm. One I picked up on the uh, Home Racing World on YouTube. I, I beg your pardon, sorry. That's what a little tip that I picked up on watching Hot Race Home Racing World's video on YouTube. Oh, just doing the dots, yeah. Yeah, just he just does a, lot, a little row of dots. Looks good enough. From a foot away, two foot away. Yeah, and also I guess as the car is going around the track, it would look the same. That's a great idea. Yeah. Awesome. So Thank you, Aaron, John. There you go. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else got anything they want to show and tell? New car, new project. Dennis always has something going. What you got today, Dennis? Uh, let me unmute myself. Hi guys. Um, just one photo today. Uh, what the hell happened to it? Hang on a moment, I'll have to we'll get back to you in a minute. Um, <laughs> there it is. Oh, production time. Production time, yeah. Can you believe it? Five of these things. These are the, the Policar um, Monoposto, this new generic Formula One that Policar have got out. And when I did my, my own one, uh, the, manager, the store manager at Electric Dreams took a photograph of it, put it on his website, and within, a, within a, I think within a day, we had four orders, and then within a couple of days, there were five. So I've had to be sitting. I've been putting on decals for two days, solid. But there uh, they are. <laughs> I hope you're getting paid extra for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get a certain amount per body, you know, and you just... Hey, listen, Dennis, at least they were decals. You didn't have to paint them. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I, yeah I would have I would have uh, resisted that suggestion if I'd had to paint them. I wouldn't mind painting one. I mean, I've done that kind of stuff in the past. I've, I've painted that sort of detail. Uh, not so much on a 132nd scale, more on 18 scale radio control car bodies. Painted gazillions of little stars and things. But uh, what, what, yeah, those are like Mercedes logos, right, aren't they? Yes, it's it's the little three pointed star. Of Mercedes. Did, did they even put a red one in for Lauda? Because I think there's a red one in there somewhere. Or was uh, there Lauda. was, but not last year. These are the this, this is to the twenty twenty. Oh right, car. I'm sorry. Oh right, you're right, you're right. I'm sorry. Black car, and the only red they've got are those little sponsor uh, sponsor logos alongside the intake uh, tower, just below the the the, the, the TV camera, the, the camera that's on the top, the top of the of the air intake. But yeah, that's that all of those um, stars on the side, it's three three complete decals per side. One for the one for the flat sur the, the horizontal surface, one for one each for the, the the sides of the air intake and then a third one on the fin. 
and then the 44, the number that's at the back is a separate one. So there's, I don't know, I don't remember how many individual decals, but it's, it's, a, it's quite a few. But I did them, I did them in a proper production line. I started with the rear wings. I did all the rear wings first. Then I did all the front wings first. Then I did all the nose detail on each car. Then I did all the one side detail on each car. Then I did all the other side detail. And then I did all the stars at the last, the last detail. I think you could produce a lot more of those, Dennis. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I hope not. I mean, anybody can do it, right? It's just a, it's just a matter of buying the car and the decal set. Uh, but out here we have a number of people that are, you know, we prefer just to pay somebody to do it, which I, I find a little bit frustrating. Because really, <laughs> people it. do. <laughs> it's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the hobby, right? It's, it is, but it's not. Everybody doesn't have to enjoy every part of the hobby. <laughs> oh, I suppose, yeah. I think you'll find that's a global phenomenon, and you could produce several. In fact, you could go on and do the other body shells, could you not? Because they do the I've, stickers for the whole lot, the, the, yeah, the whole just, grid. Yeah, I've just done a. I've just done. A, uh, we actually got Athalaya um, specifically for Electric Dreams to produce us a couple of sets of um, those kind of what do they call them? Uh, um, heritage liveries or. Um, Acknowledgement liveries, or they, they have a name for them. I don't remember it right off the top of my head. So I just painted one. I got a white kit and painted it yellow, and just put on a whole set of camel, uh, camel lotus uh, decals yeah. um, to uh, to um, uh, commemorate um, Senna. The, the the guy who managed. No, Johnny Herbert. Green. Surely Johnny Herbert is the man that drove those. Yeah. Senna drove alongside him, but I think you should be commemorating Johnny. <laughs> the thing about it, of course, is that you know that first off, the manager of Electric Dreams is a is a young Brazilian guy, so uh, you know it's all Senna and nothing but, unless it's PK. Um, but uh, secondly, um, these little helmets that we use come from a company called Interlagos Miniatures, which is also a Brazilian company, and uh, they haven't quite gotten around to. To acknowledging the fact that Johnny Herbert even existed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're getting there slowly, but uh, you know, even you know, even guys like um, I think Charles Leclerc is the is the latest one that they have now. It's mostly F1. Yeah, but Johnny could have done it. I've got that car here somewhere. I'll grab it and I'll sh sh show it up to you. But that's my share for the day. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing that uh, car in a, moment, in a moment. Does anybody else have anything they want to show or talk about? Well, I got some, I got something, Greg. Go ahead, Kelly. Um, this, this is a car I did a while, a while ago. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, I, I need to, I want to show the original car, what it looked like before I um, decided to cover it up. <laughs> so... Oh, there's the oh. Uh, oh. oh Kelly, sorry, go. That's okay. He was uh, the picture. We'll get right back to you, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so um, if for, for those of you who don't don't know, it's a it's a SCX car. Um, of course, it's a Corvette. And this is the original car that came with the set, and I I had so many. Um, lots that I purchased. I had like multiple of these Corvettes. And so um, I decided to just change, just paint it and change it. And so this is the actual, let me move my finger. The, the, there we go. Yeah, this is the finished product. Nice. A, a bronze metal flake color. Mm -hmm. darken the lights it's cool I like it and are those decals along the sides those uh, yes yes Every, no I, I don't have a steady hand like like john's daughter not at all <laughs> but yeah no this is it's all deco cool um and is it a race livery or a fantasy one there's no, this is this is a fantasy one. The stickers are race lever, uh, yeah, but the color one. of it is fan fantasy. 
And usually when I when I do a a a car or paint a car, it's usually a cup just the color that that I like. Um, I don't I'm I don't get into the liveries and trying to make them like they were. I, I pick colors that are unique, um, and then um, and then I paint them. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big NASCAR person, so I have a lot of NASCAR decals, but some of my colors don't have anything to do with NAS, uh, NASCAR. I have an actual uh, a blue candy apple um, Geico, uh, number 13 Geico car that I did, and it has nothing to do with the delivery at all. But that's just kind of what I do when I get double double makes of the cars. I just paint them different colors. So I, I, lo I love that bronze color. That's awesome. It's really good. That'd yeah. be, that might be a nice, uh, nice discussion one day for all, for all of us is, is color schemes and uh, just, you know, whether people have particular, particular uh, liveries that they, or not so much real life liveries, but personal liveries that they, that they like or that they replicate. That's a, that's a great idea. And then we can talk about digital versus analog and wood versus plastic. And... <laughs> yeah, that's well, that's cool. I like that. Was it black at the back or was it? Uh, uh, my car? Yeah, with black or was yeah. it kind yeah, of charcoal it, color? And no, it's, it's black with, oh, with black. Uh, okay. with uh, charcoal accent around the side as well. Yeah, uh, the charcoal is is the is the decal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, last order, but that's nice. That's really that's very pretty. I like it. I like Thank it. you. Yeah, good job, Kelly. Yep. You got there's the, Go ahead, there's that. There's uh, that camel car. Found it. Oh man, <laughs> these damn lights. Oh, there there we go. How's yeah. that? Oh, now it very popped cool. away from me. I can only see you now. You should only be seeing you. Yeah. I'm seeing you. It's on speak of you. Let me try this again. Spotlight. There you go. Good. Let's try to get some of the light away here. Yeah. Thanks. So it's the same body. Yeah. Hold on. Right? Uh, it was the white one painted, painted yellow. And then all of these um, decals put on it. Oh, that looks like a simpler one to do. Oh yeah, much, much similar. Here's the wing for the rear. Do you, air, do you airbrush paint or brush? No, nah, that's out of a spray can. Ah, spray can. <laughs> yeah, I rattle can everything. Rattle can, yes. And then it has a it has a coat of clear um, acrylic over the top, which is that that um, pledge floor floor shine stuff that, that stuff works the best it's so absolutely man. it's so yeah. much easier than it and i put it on i have one of those little about an inch wide foam brushes yep. and yes. i use that and as foam put that on and let it drip off and it, it's the it's the easiest and safest and to so, my mind one of the best clear coats you can possibly get so now dennis do you do it after you get done painting or do you do it after you put the decals on after the decals go on yeah yeah, because you want to protect the decals. Right. Yeah, and the great stuff because it's it's acrylic based, it doesn't really harm the decals at all. No, and sometimes it actually helps to settle the decals onto the car too. Uh, on those Mercedes, the the little stripes down the front wing that have to go kind of down the stairs mm -hmm. of the wing. Uh, sometimes those don't settle very well, but once they've got the the clear on them, they stay down. <laughs> well done, oh, yeah. as always. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and this one's got that that little uh, magnetic uh, yeah, the front wing. wing attachment on the front. Oh wait, so the wing will actually fly off if it if it gets yeah. bumped instead of breaking. Yeah, look it, at that. It, it'll it'll drop if you if you if. But yeah, that's awesome. That's like that's that's that should add to some real racing fun. Now what happens is <laughs> you know there's there's a there's a magnet in here, right behind the nose, and another one in there. And there's a couple of little indentations. Um, Locator pins. Yeah, a big one and two little ones. And that just allows the whole thing to, to snap in. 
Well, that's a much better system than Scalectrics had with the sort of snap-in thing. Yeah, they do provide uh, in the stock, um, in the, the, in, the, in the kit, they provide you with a little plastic clip that goes in there that I guess you could glue in one side and then have it loose on the other side. Because if you don't glue it in one side, at least you're going to lose it as soon as you knock it off. But um, those magnets are the ones that Slotted use for their magnetic suspension. Um, and they're $5.99 for 10 or $5.99 for eight of them or something like that. And they just slide in and you press them into those two little gaps in there. You just have to clean the, clean the paint off those two surfaces. Because so, so, as soon as you so what start about painting, the wing? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, John. What about the wing? Do the wing do the same thing or, or do you at have to... At the rear? Yes. No, no mm -hmm. at, the rear, it, at the rear, it plugs into the chassis. It's, and it's, uh, it, it, so it's not attached to the body. It's attached to the back of the chassis. Mm -hmm. And there's two little, there's two little um, slots in the chassis where it presses in. Now, I guess you could just press it in and leave it in. Uh, it doesn't, um, I haven't assembled these cars, uh, mainly because you can't get them back in the box if you assemble them. Um, but I would think that you could probably just press it in and leave it. And then if it does come out, just press it back in again. Because if you glue it in, it's going to break. It would be so awesome if you could have a piece of scenery that animates a spectator running off with one of those wings. <laughs> <laughs> or a corner worker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm picking hilarious. up a wing. Picking up a wing somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so all those F1s that use the magnets to hold it on are now magnet racers? I guess, yeah. <laughs> What's the source spot going to be there? The, 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 <laughs> the magnetic field is, is in this direction, so probably in this way it's not going to give you much downforce. <laughs> no, but once the wing comes off, you got no downforce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you keep the magnet, you still have downforce, just a little. Well, oh, maybe you should make, make sure the magnet's in, in, in the wing so that when you lose it... Well, there's two, right? There's one there's in two. each side. Oh. There's one, there's one in the wing and one in the, in the body. Otherwise, mm. it's not strong enough. What kind of there tires we... are you using on yours, uh, Dennis? When I run these, in, uh, the, 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 the poly cars right now, I'm running, my, I'm running the stock tire. Um, and tomorrow when I go into, in, to, into Electric Dreams, I'm going to start investigating, see whether I can find a, a softer rubber tire for it. Um, because it, it's, a, it's a new size, I think. I don't know that there's going to yeah. be a, a, an option tire yet. And I know that the, um, the uh, silicon tire guys haven't yet uh, come out with anything. Paul uh, Gage has. Okay. Well, I don't run urethanes at home, but... Uh, yeah. So that would be good for those that do. Uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be a silicon tire for it soon, if not from sure. super tires, then from quick slicks. Um, and talking of that, I saw today that they, or yesterday, that quick slicks have released a, 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 a silicon tire for the rear of the NSR Formula Ones now as well. That you, the NSR generic 86 to 89 Formula One, they have a, they have a. Uh, silicone tire for that. So those who run on silicones, there's a good option. Because that's a strange size as well, because they're a very small wheel with a very big with a very big tire. And how long has that been carbon on the market? Eight months, ten months? The NSR? Yeah, yeah it's been it's been out there a while, that's for sure. And we can expect a tire for the slot it twenty two perhaps. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I'll, I'll get hold of Mike Scott at, at uh, Cloverleaf and push him a little, see what he can do. Awesome. It takes him a little bit of time to get them to get the molds machined, I think, because it's yeah. They they, mold, they machine a pretty decent mold for those things. Does anybody else have any show and tell they want to show off? I do. All right, Big Den raised his hand first, then we'll get to Mike. Go ahead, Big Den. Are you still muted? Take two. There you go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Um, missed last meeting. Had another commitment. Uh, following on from Dennis's um, expose on these SRC McLaren, 
one of my latest uh, F ones is the Fly Hesketh. Yeah. Very good. Yep. With a simple livery that's effective. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, a very nice, it's a pretty nice car. They run the same chassis as I recall as the March seven sixty ones. Yeah, I'm looking right at the bottom of it now, Dennis. Yeah, that's it. And um, that chassis remember? works. That chassis works really well. The best of the best of all the fly F ones. That's for sure. Yeah. Yep. Remember to um, keep the driver in the car; otherwise, he'll throw up. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure whether this one's got the quality for Interlagos miniatures, but it's quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was brought up last week was the fragility of the front axle, you know, the steering setup. Um, I generally, you know, down our, our clubs down in Tasmania here, we, we lock the steering where that's a permitted modification and just have the guide, you know, running free, you know, um, independent of the suspension. But I actually broke the suspension on this car while I was driving it around in its first race. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't hit anything and it just broke straight away. What, what, other... what, let, what, Dan, what let go? Was it the tie rods that let go? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, or you know, the wishbone. I think it broke at the wishbones, John. Um, yeah, but it's, I just, I mean, I, I flew off the line, did a couple of laps, was competitive with the poly cars. Um, and then all of a sudden I started slowing up and I, found out I had wheels splaying out at about, you know, 45 degrees yeah. off straight ahead. So uh, yeah. Toe out is okay, but not that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other thing that was notable about this car when I um, first bought it, this was the special Australian edition. Um, don't know whether you've heard of it or not, but how I knew it was the Australian edition was the back axle was bent like a boomerang. <laughs> it was... <laughs> I was going to say something upside down. You know. no, I, I thought maybe it just had an extra strong magnet. <laughs> no, yeah, for down under. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah it, was, it was the worst bend I've ever seen in an axle. I, I thought at first it was the, yeah, the wheel was off center on the axle. But when I investigated further and put it, you know, the bend was it's not quite pronounced, you know, in the, where they, so they said it looks like they crimped the axle to put a little, um, you know, grip area on it, and they crimped it really well and bent it about 30 degrees off from, off, you know, off straight from the, um, yeah, you know, you know, I've got this tire, that's, this wheel that's going round and round like this, like a cam, and um, yeah, so replaced the axle, and, and uh, it's been okay since. So the, the front wing, you know, the little extra front wing, is a little um, supplementary front wing there, um, that could be quite fragile. So I've taken a bit of clear plastic and made a, you know, a support that runs underneath the, from the, front, the small front wing back to the body just to give it a bit of extra strength. So that's it. Yeah. I, I just like the idea of the underdog coming into F1, you know, and um, <laughs> taking on the big boys. So I had to yeah, have you know, like When you race it, you'll have to serve, you know, champagne and oysters and stuff because that's what Hesketh started. They started yeah. the whole paddock thing. Yeah, or jump out of the car and go chasing women or something like that, like a certain driver was known to do. But <laughs> God rest his soul. <laughs> yeah, okay, folks, that, that'll do me for the day. Thanks for sharing, Big Dan. And Mike, nice. can we go ahead? Go ahead, Mike. Um, I've got some stock cars to set up. Got that one. And this one is all already apart that's the monogram one no no uh carrera. 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 Ah. yeah they take extensive work <laughs> in order to get them to run decently so what, what 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 do you do to them mike um well he takes the chassis out and then he puts a slot of chassis in. <laughs> no i do not <laughs> you can see well it's hard to hard to tell without a surface but it's it's uh it's slammed pretty healthily. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's down. It's so down. I, I drop the posts and uh, take out a little bit of the interior so the motor goes up. And uh, and then they run pretty well. So do you, do you change the tires at all? Do you change the tires? At oh, all? yeah. Oh, yeah. Always. I, I sort of use Paul Gage all the time. So they're, uh, they're, they're good tires mm -hmm. for that. 
Um, although they haven't done too well with the with the Polycar F1, I'm starting to be able to get it around the track, but it's still pretty seriously slippery. So we'll see. I'm hoping somebody comes out with a really really soft rubber tire for it, so that I can actually drive the thing instead of spinning around in circles. The, the problem is, is if the, the controller gets so sensitive with that, you know, you get wheel spin instantly, no matter how little you touch it. So yeah. I have did to figure play, that out. Did you play around with the throttle curves yet? Yeah, I played around with the throttle curves uh, a little bit. I, I just did it today. I just got the tires today. So that's why I was just trying. Um, but I haven't found anything appropriate yet. I'm still working on that. Um, it'd be nice if we could, you know, do as you can, like the De, DeFalco has their controllers are able to be change resistors to bring the position down in the, in, on the controller. But I'm hoping to get the curve right somewhere along the line that I can actually drive them. So yeah, I mean, either, either the curve, since you're, di since you're digital, are you running them in, in digital mode or analog mode? Digital. Yeah. So, so you can turn down the max power. You can you know, play with throttle curves that basically have no power through most of the trigger pull. It's, yeah. it's in there. You just got to experiment with it until you find something you yeah. like. I mean, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had enough time to play with it yet. I'm which, too busy setting up uh, cars for my buddies. Which digital chip did you put in the Formula One? Uh, I put in the, uh, the Scalextric uh, F1 chip, the, the aftermarket one. Okay. And I fit it in there, although I'm going to have a little bit of trouble getting the driver in just right. Okay. But oh, me, so you're on you're on you're on SSD, right? So you're, you're yes. On yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were on on Carrera. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Then I can understand. Yeah. Then it's easy. So yeah. those Carrera cars, Mike, you you chip them as well, or? Oh yeah. Yeah. Chip them. Yeah. I've got easy. I've got about eighty five percent of my hundred and twenty cars chipped. Uh, so it's so I can just take them out and run them, and. Um, and it, it, it works really, really well. I really enjoy the digital aspect. Um, the other two guys that with, I race with on Mondays. I was going to say, especially um, with the NASCARs, you can really get some rubbing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the two guys that I race with are 124th racers, and they're really having a good time um, racing, racing the cars that I've got for them. So I'm setting up three stock cars so we can run the, the three of us can run together. And, uh, well, yeah, been, uh, to, to your point, I really like those Carrera NASCARs because they're really quite robust. Yeah. Yeah, you can do barrel rolls with them. Trust me on that. Big Dan, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, question, uh, not question, so a couple of uh, comments there, Greg. Yeah. Uh, your barrel rolls with Carrera cars is called cornering. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I've I've got the the, the uh, there's a very good um, tutorial or how to on home racing world about setting up those NASCARs about removing a lot of the material around the body posts so that you've got more yeah. uh, you know float and everything in the back end. Um, I did the '92 car s some time ago and I actually got hold of some MJK tires from down here in Australia and they oh, yeah. work quite quite well. And mm. um, my most recent acquisition is the very gaudy pink and yellow car, um, uh, the Superbird, I think it is, a Daytona oh, yeah. Superbird. So I haven't done a lot of work on that one yet, but, you know, remove a lot of weight out of the interior and things like that is, you know, just to keep get the top end down a bit further than, than uh, the standard. Oh, and striking back for the analog, analog guys, I've got no percent of my cars chipped. <laughs> on that topic I'll, I'll go ahead because when i was first when i first got into slot cars it was primarily digital and i was i was like chip everything you know i'd get a carrera i'd get a slot it and i'd put a chip in it because you know that's how i wanted to race with them and then i got an upgrade to the power base that, that gave it analog mode this was before the ones that had built-in analog mode because i was starting to race with the analog club but i would still start you know it's still chip practically every car i bought and i'll be buying dpr chips and all that kind of stuff but eventually i got to the point where i'm like well why am i chipping a car that i'm only going to drive by itself and so then i started making sets you know like i have a, a a modern gt gt3 set of cars that you know 
would race together and I, you know, I'll, I'll break them out when I race with the guys or I have a slot at group C set. I have a slot at classic uh, Le Mans set. I have, you know, a variety of sets of digital cars that I've gone through the process of chipping and tuning relatively equally so that they're all, you know, relatively competitive. But pretty much after that, I'm like, <clears throat> no, I'm just not because I can always put my track in analog mode. If I just want to turn some laps with the new car, that's what I'll do is just turn, turn laps with the new car in analog mode rather than chip a car that I'm never going to have on the track at the same time as any other car anyways. And then further on, <laughs> I, I got to the point where I stopped just buying every single car that looked kind of cool. And now I only buy cars that I need because we're racing them in, a, in, in either the analog or digital club and I need a car that fits that class. And it needs to be blue and yellow. So <laughs> I don't buy a whole lot of cars these days. The, the last car I bought was, you know, a bunch of blue and yellow cars. But the last car I bought that wasn't blue and yellow was the DeLorean, the Back to the Future DeLorean. And the next cars I'm buying that aren't blue and yellow are the classic Batmobile and the Knight Rider kit car that are coming out from Skelectric this year. But I, I'm saving a whole bunch of money by not chipping cars. <laughs> it, it sounds, Greg, like your definition of need is fluid. Yeah, oh, that's, absolutely. Over the years, yeah, oh, willpower. <laughs> which I have very little of. So it's actually quite remarkable that I'm able to do this in any capacity. And again, I, I still fail from time to time. I do buy the DeLorean, but I've been wanting movie cars forever. I'm just glad they're finally doing well, actually, you brought up a, you bring up a really good subject. Actually, are you know like non racing cars? How how many? I'm because you know I have some street cars as well, but like, does anybody use them for other than just sort of watching it around the track? Or like, for example, like Auto Heart had a beautiful Lamborghini Miura, but they never raced a Lamborghini Miura. Um, I, you know, I could see I could see maybe in a couple of years when there's four or six movie related cars doing a digital race of a DeLorean, a Batmobile, a kit, hopefully an A-Team van at some point, you know, a, a Ghostbusters Ectomobile, you know, all these <laughs> classic TV and movie cars racing in a race. But other than that, no, it's, for me, they're just, they're just, I, I love those things. Therefore I want the slot car of it. And I'll, I drove it around the, the, um, the Back to the Future DeLorean is especially uh, cool because, of course, it has lights, but it also lights up the flux capacitor in the in the interior. And of course, you can stick the pole on the back and pretend like you're, you know, trying to go back to the future. We we actually had a had a series a couple of years ago down in Tassie, and it was called Movie Cars, and it was cars that only you know took part in movies. Uh, um, you know, the outrageous one was uh, one guy raced Mater, the little tow truck, out of cars. So, because uh, <laughs> it, was, it was in a movie. Yeah. Probably a lot of Bond cars in that race, you know, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of Jags and yeah. stuff. And, and I just wondered if John is getting any royalties for with the Knight Rider car being released. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, I only spell my name with one T. <laughs> well, I've got a show and tell uh, to do. Yeah. Just yeah. a quick one. Um, I was commissioned to do a, uh, a 3D print for somebody, and oh, that's what I need to share, but that's not what I want to share. That's my 3D printer. This Brian, is... I, I saw that just before we switched over. You got to bring that back. What, my printer? No, Brian Brian showed Mater. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll switch back to that in just a sec. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a 3D printed slot car stand, yeah. right? And this was specifically designed. This, these are the features he wanted, but it's for 124 scale cars. There's my scale auto Audi on the on the short one. And there's a BRM. And then there's this tilt up one that he wanted. He's got like a rotational display, and so he wants a bunch of cars tilted up in the back so that they. That's display. a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. So it, it you know you stick the guide in so it doesn't you know slide forward. And okay. just, now, if it still has the magnet, can you put a piece of metal in there so it really, you know, adheres to it? Or I certainly could do that. Yeah, that would not be a hard thing to change in the design. But just thought I'd throw that off. That's very nice. cool. All right, Brian, you wanted to show off. Uh... 
There we go. Let me. Hey, Greg, are you selling those or? I I can't. I'm going to ask, I'm I'm ask the guy who commissioned that if he's okay with me uploading it or selling them because technically it was his design. And all I did was throw the CAD together, which is like five minutes because he had already done the design work. So, Looks but like yeah. an ice scraper for Windows. I expect you'll say yes. So I'll probably be putting that up on my site and on Thingiverse. Is that the 143rd meter? I assume it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, I haven't found a slot at chassis for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, got these with the grandkids when they were younger. Yep. I had this. I have uh, the Lightning McQueen. I actually have one of the Formula One's little silver uh, one that was – I could set it up where it would not come off the track and trying to chase that thing around at 12 volts was hard. Now, wasn't the Mater designed to go backwards? Or does it go? Uh, no, this one runs forward. Okay. I, I, I seem to remember there being a slot car one that goes backwards. Or it might have been the pull toy that goes backwards. Huh. Yeah, it must have been the pull toy because I remember when that movie first came out, I wanted slot cars of them, but they didn't exist at the time. So, so I bought the pullback cars, which were one thirty second scale, and I was going to put a chassis under them. In fact, if you look at my old YouTube videos, you can find a Finn McMissile, which I converted into a Skelectric car. So it's, they had a bunch of one thirty second scale-ish pullback toys, and I'm pretty sure the Mater is backwards. So you pull them back and he backwards. <laughs> They are producing some of those in 132nd now, but I'm not sure which ones. I mean, I have the Carrera, um, you know, main character. I forget his name now. <laughs> and the uh, the the Formula One, you know, the, the French jerk guy. Yeah. Second but, while I got this up, I want to touch on something, if you don't mind, that yeah. was kind of alluded to by Chris and Dennis a couple ago, a couple of sessions ago. And I was wondering and mainly because of a chassis design I'm working on now, what is the big disadvantage to this type of setup, the pin with the fixed brushes versus a movable blade? It jams in the slot. This car has no issue with that whatsoever. When it's, when it's not long enough to be jamming in the corners, is it? No. I would say there's the only disadvantage there is the potential for that pin to experience quite a bit of wear. But that's it. I, we I, ran I, we ran with pin guides in one thirty second scale for many years. Um, those if you go looking back at the history in in the Midwest, there were guys who ran pin guides there well into the into the late nineteen sixties. Yeah, um, yeah, Chris kind of alluded to that uh, a couple times ago, and I was curious. It was something because I'm trying to build a chaparral for the three D challenge, okay. and where that guide has to go on that thing to clear that body is actually the post for that is behind the front axle in order to give it clearance for the wires yeah. and everything else to work on so, that chassis. Yeah, so if you wanted to, I mean, it can be done. I've got a, I've got a, a couple of pin guide cars with no magnets that run on my wood track and they run fine. And the, um, the uh, uh, what's his name? It's the TSRF cars uh, were all made without a, Without a pin. Those Carrera go cars, the the, it's a wedge, not a pin. Yeah. So if the car starts to slide, if you're doing no magnet, it, it can it can It'll wedge jam. A lot. Yeah. But specifically, Skelectric track with their exceptionally narrow slot, those Carrera go pins, stock can wedge in stock Skelectric track. Just because the, the the dang slot is so narrow, and I think on Ninco you probably find the same problem. Yeah, so I mean that that's the it's not that the pin is bad; it's that it's not necessarily going to work in every track you stick the car on. But I mean, if you're getting down to the point of it of it wedging like that, uh, doesn't the regular guide wedge at the same spot? The the regular Carrera guide would, yeah. Uh, um, or even what? a regular slotted guide. Nope. I've never had a slotted or skeletric guide wedge in my tracks at all, but a Carrera Go, all over. Yeah, Carrera. Yeah, I run, yeah. I run skeletric sport and I've never had twisted. a wedge. I'm not, I'm but, skeletric sport too. I'm just. This is my experience. I'm not saying that it's. I got you. I got you. 
But at the same time, that means if it's happening to me, then it's probably happening to other people out there too. I, I don't agree. I'm the single. So what, what we're saying then is that if you make a pin that is the width of the slot, then all it can do is rotate in there and you will spin completely around instead of uh, locking yeah. on the guide. Yeah. And that's what, like every HO car is. Like every HO car, exactly. And, well, except those with a slide guide, but uh, yeah. Fair the, you between the, it. the TSRFs are like that and everything that I've made has been like that. Um, uh, the big well, issue. Yeah. When I was a kid with HO, I'd be wanting them to spin around on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> the the, the, the big issue with a pin, though, is that uh, number one, uh, it's very, very depend. It's 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 very dependent on decent braid settings, and if you don't have the braids in the right place, uh, they don't work terribly well. Uh, uh, pin guides like to have very short braids, and the end of the braid. Needs to, the, the free end of the braid needs to be basically uh, where the pin is and the braid forward of that in the car. Second, the other thing is um, when you de-slot with a pin guide car, it's going to drop into the very next slot that it comes across, right? There is no way that that car goes over another slot without dropping into that slot, right? Whereas a, whereas a car with a guide very often will come out, but not necessarily drop into the next slot. And um, on high speed tracks, that's always a problem. Mm, that's a good point. Well, well to, your, to your earlier point, Dennis, about TSRF, TSRF was originally designed with a little blade and then- they It had a blade originally, yes. Yeah. And those yeah. blades used to break uh, and they would snap off if the car got too sideways. Right. And then they went to the, to the steel pin, which is tapered. So it's thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. Um, and uh, they were great, but um, a lot of the commercial tracks banned them because unless you rounded the bottom edges properly, they would start tearing the braid up as the car came out of the slot, right? And um, so there were a lot of commercial tracks that said, uh -uh, none of those things on our tracks, thank you. Because there was a little burr right on the bottom end where it had been turned and parted off. And they hadn't been cleaned up. And if you didn't clean up and round off those edges, it did damage them. But um, uh, I still, in some ways, like, a, like a, a pin guide because it's a very, very firm, solid connection at the front. There's no slop in it. Yeah, I was going to say, see, there's, no, there's no wobble whatsoever. There's no right? wobble there. Yeah. And when you see some of, the, some of the plastic cars that we have going around, and even on... on um, some of the, the proxy cars that come by me, uh, the fitment of the guide's so bad, and there's so much slop there that the car's handling is really, uh, you know, like they used to say about a, uh, about a, a, a minis, uh, those long gear changes, that it was the next best thing to mental telepathy. And some of those guides are the same when it comes to cornering. <laughs> yeah, the fl fly even has that problem. That's why, oh, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Most clipping guides seem to have that, don't they? Everything that clips in has a lot of flop. Uh-huh. Did you show enough, Dennis? Yeah, show, show. No, oh, why? Oh, that Dennis. Yeah. That Dennis. Yeah, th th this is, uh, yeah, uh, just to, to go back to Brian's point, I'm just showing you a car because this is um, uh, the guide system. This is a, a Carrera Opal Jumbo, uh, sort of an outrageous Group 5 car from the from the early 70s, I think, and uh, maybe before it was Group 5. But um, I bought this car because a, a, a friend of mine modelled a 30-second scale Lexan body of it way back in the in the 90s. But what I wanted to show Brian was that if you look at the chassis, the guide actually pivots behind the front axle. That's not the stock Carrera guide. No, no. But okay. that's the stock career guide position. Oh, for that car, yeah. It, it's got one of the CG adapters in it to, to yep. replace it. But you said that the guide position is is as it came from the factory. It's, you know, the, because of the the way the you know the front of the body goes over, there's no room for a post to to go up underneath. So now, now Dan, that that car looks to have a pretty long wheelbase, though, no? Uh, not all that long, I don't think, John. I'll just find something to compare it with here. I mean, sometimes the body 
just precludes a guide in front of the, the front axle. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, mean, that's no, exactly. It's exactly, virtually exactly the same wheelbase as the Hest Formula One. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that's something then. Yeah. 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 That's why Slotic came up with their their LMP style guide is so that it could be so low and short <laughs> and, and those cars can have. Brian's those. got one. Brian's got one that's similar. Ah, there we go. This is actually the 2J I'm working on. This I'm going to have to redo this body. I actually broke it. No. But uh, there you can see, I just did, I, I redid this chassis today. I tried, I had to scoot it back a little bit. But if you can imagine, the axle there is right about where the wires and everything plug into that guide. Yeah. And there just is not room in there to come much forward. The way that front slopes. Mm -hmm on the chassis that came with the car, the top of the guide was literally right here. You could not set the body down on the chassis with any kind of guide on it. Yep, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. So. That, by yep, the way, that, that, Brian, that's a really nice 3D print, by the way. Thank you, sir. Um, so I have reworked this chassis a little bit. His, his Sidewinder chassis was kind of weird. Um, so this is my chassis kind of based on his, but, uh, and I don't use the CG uh, guide. I actually use the Greg Gaub guide system on mine. Um, plugged. I actually, uh, I print it because it allows me to adjust the height. If you notice, Greg, I'm pretty sure this is your stuff off of Thingiverse. No, it was to repair, I've, never designed, I've never designed it. To repair the scale electric stuff. Oh, whoa, whoa, the ring. The ring, yeah, oh, yeah. and uh, yep. what I do is I, I print this as a separate piece, and then I can literally, it, if you look, I actually positioned it so it raised the guide closer to the chassis a little bit, and then I glued them in place. So it allows me to fine tune that a little bit. That's a good idea. Um, so it, that's what works, but again, there's so little room there um, actually, I think you might even be able to see where the axle's kind of peeking through there on the bottom of that. Yeah. On how close yeah, you that. Can see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't really have much. The car runs like a raped ape. It's this is a Piranha motor in it. Um, that's a tungsten weight, by the way, not a magnet. Good man. And if you believe that, I got a swamp. I'd love to sell you. I got. Um, I already got a bridge. Yeah. Well, then you need a swamp to go with it. I guess so. <laughs> but I was just starting to play with my airbrush again after a while. And just, this is a resin print right off the printer. Nice. But this will be getting totally redone. This was kind of. I love, I love the Martian bra on the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one that came with it was horrible. Those, those turbine bullets were about three times that size and were perfectly round. They didn't have the points to them like uh, the actual one did. So I tried yeah, to mop it. Yeah. But believe it or not, that whole that whole air system was powered by a snowmobile engine. Yeah, I thought it was a helicopter engine, but I I wouldn't wouldn't quote me on that. So, but uh, yeah, so I, I thought this might be a good candidate for a pin system. Um, you know, they always talk about the triangle, but as you can see, I got fairly wide tires on the back of that thing, and it is fairly stable. And it, it actually, it again, I'm a magnet racer. The car runs remarkably well, and I, I'm attributing that somewhat to the width. In the width of the tires on it. Are you also planning to countersink the screws a little bit too? Yeah, this was this chassis just came off the printer today, and I just wanted to see how it would fit. So you can see it's kind of a mishmash, and that's another reason the body needs to get redone. It's very brittle, and I actually broke some of the guide posts when I was trying to thread the holes. It's oh. it's a problem I have with that. So I came up with a system. This is this is what happened when I tried to put the post on the original print. Oh. Um, so what I've done is I'm doing this now with it. I think you can see this. Yep. I'm actually embedding some evergreen tubing in those to thread them. Have you have you so. thought about using you know those grommets that Monogram, Ravel, and Cox used to use in the '60s? No, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were not they weren't they weren't grommets they were inserts little brass inserts, inserts. right yeah there were brass inserts right Dennis yeah. Mm -hmm. Little breath, the little brass insert that went into a hole 
and then as you screwed the screw in, it expanded the insert and grabbed it. If you look on Professor Motor's site, I think he actually has them uh, for sale still. I think Slack Car Corner does too. They sell it as part of a repair kit, a post repair kit. Right. Yeah. I'm not, that I'm might not paying be... $9 for screws for a car. <laughs> I guess uh, so that's dedicated. Or, you know, I right hear, now, or but, but hang on, could, is that something, and, and again, I'm a neophyte when it comes to 3D printing, is that something you can 3D print perhaps? Uh, yeah. Probably, but again, the evergreen tubing works fine. I just, mm -hmm. I just, you know, print that hole big enough where maybe I got to sand that tubing a little bit and slide it in there and it threads really nice. Okay, so, yeah, I, I was just I thinking of, of something that was actually threaded versus something that, that's sort of self-tapping. That, that's kind of where my head was at for you, sorry. Um, but you know, the 3D printer, I figure right now that, that 2J you saw, which I'm gonna probably scrap 90% of it, cost me about 700 bucks. So, you know, well, I'm, I'm counting the two printers, guys. You know, I've, I've got an Ender 3 Pro, I've got a Creality resin, you know, the resins, the spools and everything. So if you think you're going to get into 3D printing to save you money, um, you're not. You do it for the love of it more than anything. And it's again, it's part of the hobby. Um, but yeah, and, and that's part of the fun is coming up with the solutions to these things. I've got some new resin in ABS like, but the problem is I'm finding and Greg, you maybe you can confirm this for me, temperature is huge when it comes to printing this stuff. My house right now, I'm in Southern Illinois, my house is at about 68 degrees during the day. And that is not, that's the very bottom end of the temperature range they recommend for printing resin. The bottle I have in front of me right here says 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. Well, 30 is 86 and 25 is 68, nine is like 77, something like that. Yeah, you can you can do things like you know pre-warm the resin before you pour it in and stuff, or or you put put the vat of resin with a cover on it on your 3D printer bed to warm it up there before you then put it in your resin printer and hit start. Uh, but I moved my resin printing stuff up into a spare bedroom, one so that I could vent fumes straight out the window through, through various filtering mechanisms, but two because that room gets fairly warm when you know it's upstairs and it and when the door is shut you know it's it's heat does not help heat the house it, it heats that room and it gets toasty in there so it makes printing a lot more reliable but yeah it, you know i thought about preheating the resin but you know when the body's an eight hour print you but know it's it's, have a good foundation right i mean it warms up during the the, the printing warms up the resin right but if you start out with cold resin, it's not it's not going to get that good solid foundation. Yeah, good point there. I haven't had much problem with adhesion. Um, I find the the sides of the body tend to wrinkle a little bit, almost like it's being crushed when the plate's coming back down. I've had on a few. It's, it might be too thin. I don't know. I don't. I, I mean, that kind of happened with that one resin print I showed off weeks and weeks ago, yeah. where the panel was really super thin and it just kind of split and folded. So that's, I think that's usually more likely a thinness issue, but I, I don't know. I haven't seen the model in my slicer too. Well, it, Brian, if you ever decide to go to the really dark side when you print something and then want to make a mold and multiples of, a gallon of silicone is roughly about 60 bucks. <laughs> and speaking of the temperature, I mean, if you're getting a good foundation at the temperatures that your printer is in, then don't worry about it. You know, if you can compensate throughout the print by longer exposure times, right? So if you're, you know, if you're getting warped walls and you don't think it's a, it's a wall thin thickness issue, then just bump your exposure, layer exposure a second or a half a second or something like that, just so that it's slightly more exposed because it needs that because it's a slightly lower temperature. It's not that it won't work at a slightly lower temperature unless it's like, you know, 60 degrees or some shit like that. If it's 68, it'll work just fine. It just might need a slightly longer exposure time per layer to get. There. Sorry to interrupt, Greg, but when you talk about exposure, it's, I'm, I think of almost like photography. So you have to actually expose the, the it, print. It's a UV cured resin. So okay. that's what, so with a resin DLP, the kind of consumer printers we're talking about, it's a vat of resin that a plate goes down into. And below that is a screen that exposes or allows UV light. So you got a UV light a screen 
that turns pixels on and off to allow light through, and then the resin, so it lets pixels of resin solidify because of the UV light. So every layer is created out of liquid resin by solidifying because of UV exposure. Gotcha. Okay. So it's not it's not it's not through environmental exposure. It's actually UV light that does it. Correct. Yeah, it's projected. I've resin in my in my printer that's been there for two weeks. It's still it's still liquid, and it's not going to change unless it's been exposed to UV light. Unless you leave it outside, yeah. And it's in the covers that go on top of the printers are UV blocking, right? So oh. they don't let UV in to cure the resin while it's sitting there. You know, and don't mm -hmm. let a lot of sunlight in just to make it worse. But yeah, it's. So, you, so you, you put sunglasses on your printer. That's awesome. Pretty much. <laughs> John, <laughs> it's, it's, the, the curing machine, you also want to have, you know, it, it to be UV blocking as well because you want what's inside to cure, but you don't want that UV getting in your eyes and messing up your vision. John, let me give you a little demonstration here. I got a Q-tip here that I just dabbed in some resin. I'm just going to drop it. please, please. I'm going to dab, dab it on this piece of tile right here. Okay. This is a UV flashlight. Oh, wow. That's cured. That's done. Yeah. It only that's, takes oh my, that's it? That is now hard. Holy crow. That's yep. really neat. That's why you, uh, resin printers can actually go considerably faster than filament printers because it's layer by layer, and each layer only takes a few seconds. Yep. That, you know, it's basically the way it's working is it's projecting a layer of what you're, you're printing on the bottom of the screen. And a mine, the maximum is 0 0.05 millimeters. So it's, it's curing the resin at 0 0.05 millile millimeters per slice. And you can go smaller than that if you want. That 0 0.05 is the thickest. Is the biggest. Yeah. Mine will go down to 0 0.02. Now, okay, here, here's another really dumb question. I apologize up front, but if you really want to solidify the resin print, do you then put it into like a UV chamber as you talk about to really harden yeah. it up? Yeah, yeah, you, you cure it after. Uh, after you wash off the, the residual stuff. Um, yeah, and you can cure it. You can do a chamber. I've just got a like a freestanding light on a frame. Um, a lot of guys make them out of a box. You know, personally, I like to tan at the same time. So I don't worry about the box. Well, do, now to, to, your, to your point about breaking parts of it, could it get so cured that it gets brittle? Yes. yes. And there are, are different types. There are some resins that are basically almost like rubber that you can literally print a sphere with it, um, almost print a rubber ball out of it. So sometimes it's a matter of finding the right mixture. That stuff I just did is just a basic resin, but I've got some that I just got from Elegoo that's supposed to be more ABS-like. So it's supposed to be a little- So, so just like casting, there are different types of resins. I guess there's differences in density and other properties as you desire to use them. Correct. And in this case, you can actually mix them. A lot of guys will take that rubbery type, it's called tenacious, and mix like 10% of that in with their regular resin to give it a little bit more flexibility and elasticity. So I haven't done that yet, but right. And sorry to interrupt, but that's sort of like a paint when you have flex agent in the paint. Exactly. Yeah, I awesome. Haven't... So that's that's neat. That's really neat. Sorry to interrupt. That that the chemistry is just cool. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of playing around. I do have a couple of different resins. Um, my boys got me a couple of different things for Christmas. The stuff that I have printed with is is what is called standard. It's Elegoo is the brand, standard gray resin. Uh, they got me Soriatech brand blue, B-L-U, which is not the color of it. Clear was the color of it. Blue is the name of the formulation, which is supposed to be especially strong. But yeah. it's the thing that led me to create the fume extraction system for my printer because it stank the house up even with yeah. doors shut and fume extractors fans and filters everything going strong that stuff's dang yeah, yeah. I've, been what a, this I've been using doesn't really have an odor to it and my wife's very sensitive to odors and i'm printing this stuff on my dining room table she's sitting 10 feet away and it doesn't bother her at all well, um, well regardless of whether you can smell it are there are there any vocs in it at all or yeah 
Oh yeah, you don't want this stuff on your hands, that's for sure. Okay, I so mean, it's like it's like a regular resin then. Okay. Yeah, you yeah you, you have to you have to be careful when you deal with this stuff. You don't, you don't want it on your skin, and so forth. So you have to take precautions. Okay, you don't want it. You don't want it in your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> One of the I'll, I'll be I'll be honest. I don't use as much personal protection as I should because. Uh, the the printer itself has a carbon filter. I added additional carbon filtering to, you know, with my fume extraction system. The Soraya Tech blue stuff is just stanky. You know, even if there's no, even if you remove the VOCs, you're not going to remove the smell necessarily, and it stank. But the the way that my my resin printing works is because I have the flexible plate that is on my machine that prints on. And I have the wash and cure station, so I don't have to, you know, you, you know, wash it in a tub of stuff. It washes it for me. I basically, when the print is done, I hang the head on the side of the, uh, on, I hang the head, the print bed on the printer so that it's at an angle, so any drips off, right? Do leave, leave it hanging there for a few minutes, and then I come back and I just take the whole thing and I stick it in my washing station. I'm never. I'm not even wearing gloves because I'm not touching any of the resin at, a, at any point in time. I'm, I'm holding the print head where it's not been in the resin, so it's not got resin on it. I hang it and I stick it in my washer, and that goes into a tub of of IPA. I tell it to tell it to wash, and basically it swirls the IPA in one direction for half the time, and swirls it in the other direction for half the time, and then I take it out and I let that drip dry and then I take the take the reservoir of IPA and set it aside and then using my flex plate no gloves on my hands because now there are there is no more residual resin on that plate or print Just pop the flex plate off flex the plate the print pops off I never had to use a tool to scrape it off or anything then I just you know I'll pull off the supports if there's supports because they're harder to pull off after it's been fully cured. And then I put that, put the print into my wash and cure station on cure mode. And it basically has a slowly revolving turntable and a bank of UV LEDs on one side. <laughs> put the cover back on and hit cure. And it basically just rotates it in UV light for a few minutes or seconds or however long I need it to do. And then it's done. I, I just, and then I take, I have the print, it's done. I'm, I'm good to go. With the with with the Soraya Tech, I'm thinking about wearing some <laughs> wearing some breathing protection because no matter how much I try to evacuate the the odor, it just is not it doesn't happen. I had to buy a room air filter just to help eliminate the odor, so my wife would. So you you're using IPA to wash? Yep. See, I was thinking of using maybe a Pilsner or maybe even a Stout. I was about to say the thing. same thing. I knew somebody would point that out. It's always a fun joke. IPA, of course, means isopropyl alcohol. And ah. there, was a, there was a very informative video by one of my favorite 3D printing experts on YouTube, 3D printing nerd. He did an interview with a prolific resin printing business guy. And he basically, among his other tips, said that uh, buy high percentage isopropyl alcohol because you can dilute it with water down to 40%. So 40% IPA in water, and it's still just as effective, but by volume, you're saving a whole lot of money by getting 99% IPA versus 70% IPA because that 70% isn't, you know, you're basically saving money by diluting it yourself. Yeah, it's already 30% water. Yeah. Exactly. I've, been, so. I've been using D, a straight denatured alcohol works pretty well. A lot of people use that. People use Simple Green. There's a variety of things you can use. I mean, I, obviously, none of you guys live in California. Why is oh, why is that? <laughs> you, can't buy IPA, you can't buy IPA in California anymore. You can't buy uh, denatured alcohol in California anymore. Like legally? Yep. You can't buy VMP NAFTA in California. Dang. Yeah, it's a it's a problem. Anyway. Yeah. I found I find isopropyl alcohol difficult to buy in England. I, I, I ended up buying uh, Surgical Spirit. 
not much difference. <laughs> it's probably the same stuff. It is. It's the same because it's the same stuff. But I had to find it on a chemist shelf, bottled as its surgical spirit, because I couldn't find it uh, as isopropyl alcohol. And on that bottle, there's no percentage of uh, purity or concentration indicated at all. And that's why it's world over. People are looking for alternatives, you know. And that's why there's a lot of uh, water washable resin is 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 quite popular because. You don't need chemicals. You can just wash it with regular old water. But the problem with that is that people feel that it's safe and it's not safe. Just because it's water washable doesn't make the resin safe. It doesn't make mm. it okay to dump down your drain. It's still UV resin that's going to cause problems. It just, you don't have to use isopropyl alcohol or other, you know, agents of that nature. And, and, the, and the problems are what? Dermatitis? So as, so as far as how it affects you as a human being when it when you come in contact with it, I think it's dermatitis. Right, right away, virtually nothing. You mm. know, it's a it's an irritant, and John will will agree with me. I'm I'm sure that at first there's you know you might have if you stick your hand in the stuff you might have a, an irritation or a chemical burn of some sort. But I've been touching you know carelessly and, and you know obviously I'm being more careful now, but over time, you build up a, a allergic reaction to it. So, well, and, and, the, and the other yeah. aspect too is when if, if you're just pouring two-part resins, to your point about chemical burns, not only is there a chemistry that affects and irritates the skin, but there's also, it's also an exothermic reaction. Mm. It gets hot. Yeah, yeah. it gets hot. Oh, but yeah. It's also, yeah. But also the fumes is a breathing yeah. irritant. So some people might be years before they develop any kind of allergic reaction. And some people might develop it much more quickly. You might not have a breathing reaction, but only a skin reaction. You might have no skin reaction, but a bad breathing reaction. Our favorite uh, resin caster of many years in the slot car world, uh, I think it was David, Mr. Reinecke, developed an allergy to his resins over time. And he can't even go into a room that has resins in it without breaking out. I think I remember watching that one. Yeah, so it's basically the more you protect yourself, the longer you have to be able yes. to use that yes. technology before you can't use it anymore. And and honestly, skin, skin protection is probably the most important aspect of it, Wayne. Uh, mm -hmm. At least with the with the liquid resins, uh, you you really don't want to get this stuff on your hands or or anywhere else. There's also an environmental impact with this. Now they're real big about you can't wash this stuff down the drain. You got to understand this is UV cured. So if you imagine this getting into your municipal water supply, and then it gets exposed to UV, it's going to harden. Yeah. So, and plus, do you really want those kind of chemicals in your municipal <laughs> water supply? You know, it's the same thing. They had problems with people flushing drugs down the toilet for years. You know, it's there's traces of all kinds of things in our water, and this is something you don't want in our water system. So that's when they talk about the water washable, they're saying this doesn't mean you can take it to a sink and just rinse it under water. You're supposed to take it into a tub and you're actually supposed to, when your washing material becomes too contaminated to be effective is take it outside, let the sun cure it and evaporate off your washing liquid, liquid and then dispose of it. So, you yeah, know, there's- Dispose of it, even after, even yeah. at that point, you're supposed to dispose of it as, a ha as hazardous waste. Yeah. You can't just, yeah. Even after curing it, you can't just dump it down your get down your sink or, or in the gutter or whatever. Well, yeah. Well, and then again, you, you get into with cured resin, a whole other aspect of potential hazards like sanding resin. Oh, my gosh. You don't want to breathe that stuff in at all. Oh, the dust. Yeah. Yeah. I did Which it. is why, for example, I, if you looked at what my daughter made, that th those bodies that she makes, and, and I did a little bit of a demonstration earlier, but that's the way it comes out of the mold. There's no sanding, no cut. It just goes pop. So the more episode you know, it, fifteen, kind of John. Episode fifteen. That was when you did the demonstration. <laughs> oh, thank you for no. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, but it, it and again, it, it's it, and I really the only uh, analogy I can draw is when you're building a CAD file. The more you spend making that mold, the more time you spend on your CAD the better the result and less waste and, and you really you know it makes everything easier it makes everything easier yeah yeah what are you showing there brian 
Oh, some schmutz. Your what is, what is that, Brian? Sorry. Okay, that's that's one of my original tubs of denatured alcohol. That's what happens to the resin that has been rinsed off of the other part. It's been slowly exposed to UV. And actually, I could probably take the flashlight and you could probably watch this bloom grow. So how long does your IPA actually last? Oh, I can see it clouding now, yeah. Oh yeah, look at that. That's, that oh, what I, it looks like you're doing an FX for a movie. <laughs> so it'll last a pretty good amount of time. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, it can be diluted quite a bit. Yeah. So the, the, <clears throat> the it, it's, still, it's still washing things for quite a while. Right, even yeah. even if it's cloudy, it's still doing its job. Uh, and so, what quantity is in your washing machine? What what? What quantity of it is in your wash station? Like how much IPA? Yeah. Is there? Oh, a couple uh, liters at least. Oh, a couple of liters. I was thinking you might do it in a liter, but you, you'd struggle. Yeah, yeah. It then, depends yeah. on it depends on the size of your model. I mean, you really only yeah. need enough to wash your model. Right, I have a big container of it because I like to just stick my whole thing in there and let it do its job. If I was mm -hmm. doing it by hand, then I would use small containers, you know, as long as they're big enough for my model to go in. And I would wear gloves and I would take the model off the plate and I would put it in and I would wash it. And I'd, some people use toothbrushes and things to get into all the nooks and crannies and I'd wash and yeah. then I'd rinse it in another thing. So that, to, you know, your first wash is to get off the majority of it and then your, you know, final clean wash and, and then you cure it. Um, and that's why the drip dry off the uh, off the printer is um, for a few minutes is so beneficial. It saves mucking and, up your uh, wash solution, and it saves you resin, right? When you're yeah yeah you're coming about back. lots of resin just dripping off of it. You know, you're like, okay, those those are models that I can be printed <laughs> printing later. <laughs> so so the the less resin you use and the more resin you can let drip off, the better. Both so the, the the dripping off resin hasn't suffered at all then. No. No, like I said earlier, I've, I've got resin in the vat upstairs. I haven't printed in weeks and it's still in there. Mm. Got to stir it up because it does separate. So before you try to print anything, it's been sitting there. If it's in a bottle, then you shake it and then you pour it into your printer. If it's still in your printer vat, then you stir it a bit until it's all. So, so, so really, Greg, together. what you're describing is a, a resin that the catalyst is UV light rather than another chemical. Yes, the catalyst is UV light. And like, and like Brian was showing with his uh, flashlight, uh, as long as you keep the UV out of your cleaning, right? So my, my cleaning IPA container basically stays inside my cleaning machine with the lid on so that UV light doesn't get in to cure it. Uh, so, and so it's good for, for a good long time. And it got pretty cloudy and there is, there's particulate resin and then there's probably the reactive chemical. So so if it sits for a long time and I go and look at it, I can see through it. It's clear, but there's a slight tinting to it. It's not it's not perfectly clear IPA anymore. But there is basically a a, a a flat cloud of particulate resin at the bottom of the container. So what I did was carefully decant as much of that into another container as I could until I couldn't get any without getting cloud into the other mm -hmm. container. So, so it, naturally centri it naturally centrifuges over time, I guess, right? And yeah, just gravity does the, does the yeah. job for it. But I was like, okay, well, now I need to get rid of this stuff that, I, that is too cloudy to use. And I went ahead and put that in the curing station to cure that. But I had also let it, so that had settled down. So there was still usable, there was still clear liquid that I could try to decant, but it, it was too hard. Right, so I just said, "Fuck it." Yeah. Uh, bucket, you said bucket there, didn't you? Yeah. The took it in, took it in the bucket. <laughs> I put I put that container into the curing station so that I could cure it and then dispose of it, and the stuff that was clear turned cloudy. Right, even though there was particulate resin having settled at the floor of the container, I watched that turn from clear to cloudy because there was still enough suspended in, there in order to cure. I don't know how effective it's going to be at cleaning, but it's it's basically just cloudy. It's, I thought it would gelatinize in some way, right. 
but yeah. there was still too much liquid. It's still basically a really, really cloudy liquid <laughs> and it won't filter out. It's not, it's not, uh, yeah. particles aren't big enough to filter, you know, even through a coffee filter or other, you know. But dead. you also probably have some resins that's still in solution as well. I mean, after I cured it for 15 minutes, there probably shouldn't be anything. There, there sh other yeah, te than, you're right. Technically, I guess not. Yeah, sorry. I and mean, there wouldn't be anything volatile anymore other than the resin right. itself. Right. Obviously, that doesn't get anywhere. But but, but that, there's the good news. Once once you hit it with UV, it becomes hard resin. Correct. Mm, you got to hit it long enough. Yeah. But Greg, the process you just described is how I ended up with that gelatinous vat there. I thought enough of it. I thought it had all settled to the bottom. And my plan was I was just going to expose it, cure that resin, pour off the good, clean, denatured yeah. alcohol and you know get dispose of the cured resin well no the whole damn vat clouded up and i ended up with this gelatinous mess then like you said i tried to maybe filter some of that through a paint filter now forget that you get about four or five drops out of it before it completely plugs the screen so all you can really do is let your liquid evaporate away and then dispose of the exposed material then expose the material and get rid of it because like right. you say the, you the alcohol i guess Oh, sorry. That, that was sitting for weeks, and I just shine that flashlight on it. And you can see even where there wasn't, it looked like there was clear solution. It was started to cloud up instantly. Oh yeah, you looked like you're at the uh, you're, you're in the Enola Gay at thirty five thousand feet, watching what was going on down below. That was a bomb reference, I assume. Yeah, sorry. World War. II. I mentioned I, I, I mentioned the age question. thing, right? I mentioned that. Sorry. <laughs> that was like a deep 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 deep. This for Any of this resin to glue PLA with? Glue, yeah. glue PLA? Glue PLA together. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found, for example, on that body I showed earlier, I told you I cracked and broke off a part of the body behind the turbines on the back. Well, I literally just put that piece back in place, took a, a, a Q-tip, swabbed some resin on the back side of it, exposed it for 30 seconds, and it was permanently glued black back in yeah. place. Yeah. Oh, right. You can, use it, you can use it. Right, you can use it almost like a like a, a, a like a, an adhesive, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to wonder if it would hold together uh, any of the other 3D printing materials like PLA. Probably, if only because the the layers and the extrusion gaps would allow the resin in, and therefore once it's cured, it would be holding it. Something to grab onto. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Might be worth trying. Could well, it smooth the uh, PLA 3D print by by smearing it over it and? Using it like a lacquer. That was I was just gonna say you can you can basically take a regular print, paint resin onto it, cure that, and then you can sand it and it's and it's smooth. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this back to slot cars if I may, because I've just looked up a uh, product and uh, it's a car stand, just like the ones you've been printing. Yep. I'm hoping oh. you can see my scene. That appears to be printed. Yeah, it's, it's adjustable for, you can see my pointer, for track width. Yep. You fit that either side of your crown gear or find a way to avoid your spur on a sidewinder. And there's a slot for the car. And I think it looks like it adjusts between there and the back for a wheelbase. It looks that, like, look, that looks like a Klingon war vessel from Star It does, Trek. doesn't it? Is it from uh, WSR? <laughs> yes, it is. It's from WSR. And WSR is the guy who printed those guides I showed a few weeks well back. Yeah, there were. There, I mean, I knew that there were a variety of products and printable stands out there, but yeah, we basically just said, "Here, I want stands. This is the design I had in mind." I'm like, "Okay, you know." Is that your track, Wayne? No, that's the that's our site. That, that's the WSR. Uh, I do race on this. Uh, it's not a permanent layout. It's a temporary. And these pieces, this this piece of scenery here is fits around, I don't know, let's say it fits around an R1 curve or an R2 curve. Isn't that slot think, track at Enix? No. This oh. is all WSR's home work, own work. Okay. Uh, I don't quite know. I mean, he may have purchased his tyre barriers, and, and I, I really don't know exactly. I know that this is cork. And I know that this is sandpaper, 
And I don't actually like the sandpaper because if you slide out and put a tire on it, then you're abrading your tire too much for my liking. Or if you scratch your car, you see. Well, you have to stay within the track limits then. That's that's correct. But this car, the, uh, this lane can slide the tail out and this car can't. So personally, I've had words with Paul about changing this material, shall we say, but it needs to be if, thin. If you want, sheet if you want to make those tire barriers 100% accurate, fill them with water. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, actually, rain water. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'd like Paul to, I mean, we're talking about the scenery now, aren't we? But yes, I have raced amongst this scenery and these are stock pieces that he that he takes when he uses a commercial, uh, when he does a commercial. How much are those 3D printed? Well, I'm actually looking at an eBay listing, and they are four pounds and forty pence each. Right. Now, Greg, how long would the, it take for something like that to be printed? Um, that what I'm looking at on the screen, maybe half an hour to an hour, depends on what their settings are and what their printer is capable of doing. Okay. Especially long. I print so so the guy who commissioned me to to do those stands, I printed 75 of them, 10 of the tall ones and 65 of the short ones. Uh, and basically for a platter full of 10 of the short ones took like five hours or something like that. And I was using fairly thick layers so that it printed relatively fast. So, you know, not a lot of material, not a lot of time. Uh, so yeah, those, that, that's a perfectly reasonable price for what I saw of that adjustable 3D printed stand. It's got a lot of great features. Looks like there was a couple of screws there to hold it, you know, hold it in whatever position you wanted it to, to hold in. And, yeah, yeah, well, he's got he's got a range of product building up now. Um, he he's working on chassis for cars, as all 3D printer slot car racers end up doing so. But he has tried to produce, particularly in the first place some products that are universal and all I can say is go to WSR3D either on Facebook or on eBay and you'll find not just the pictures of the, of the products but you'll find um, comments that people have left and some of those products have undergone a little bit of development. He uses a, he also has a very nice little um, a stand that rocks. Let's call it a. It's a. It's a balance plate. Um, it's got a U-shaped foot, and you can pop a car on that, and it'll wobble left and right to show you whether one side of the car is heavy. It's got a little spirit level embedded in it. It's got some. Got some nice. Got some nice little bits like that. So yeah, that's my plug for today. WSR 3D. Awesome. Anybody else got anything you want to talk about, share about, ask about? Well, I did the. I did that one mile challenge. Oh yeah? Oh good, yeah. But I think it's set up for a plastic track, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but if you can if you can tell them what your what your lane length is and you know confirm that, uh, how long did it take you to do a mile? I did it just uh, eight minutes or, and and uh, half a second. Nice. And what, what, what car did you use? You say what were you racing? Uh, a slotted, just a stock slotted car. But I, I haven't broken the eight minute yet. I only tried it twice. Did you crash? Sorry? And did, did you crash at all? No. It's a pretty simple track. And, and you're not going to hit eight minutes if you're crashing. <laughs> no, but I mean, he, he's got quite a way to go if he's, uh, if he's, you know, if he could wipe out a few crashes, he might get there. But if he didn't crash, that was my point. That was the point of the question. Yeah, yeah. What's the record at the moment? Uh, with a, oh, magnet a banked oval. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of, most of the tracks, like Love said, they're mostly plastic tracks. So you've got guys running magnets and no magnets. I don't remember what the what the overall record was, but it was probably with a magnet car in in somewhere. Of course, we're faster. Minutes. What, Brian? I said, of course, we're faster. Yes, the magnet cars are faster. There's no <laughs> argument there. And it was probably done in you know somewhere between seven and eight minutes. I, I don't think anybody's doing like crazy, you know, wing car speeds with them yet. Well, remember, it's just for fun. It's just for comparison. Fun, exactly. 
and so that magnet cars, magnet guys can have a little bit of fun. <laughs> Well, instead, really... instead of having no fun, obviously. <laughs> I, I defend a magnet racer. I love magnet racing. HO is all magnet. Well, for my experience, HO was all magnet racing, and they still slide. You guys know I'm joking. Yeah, of course. It's all all comers cars, are welcome. Aren't those wing cars doing 100 feet or 150 foot blue <laughs> tracks in like three seconds? I think it's a lot less. The world record one. It's a lot less than three students. Yeah, one eight, one eight something is it? No, is it's that, down. That, I think that I think the record right now that Brad Friesner set in um, in Pilsen in uh, in Finland was like one point three nine something or one point three eight something. Oh, that low. Yeah, yeah, they're down under the one point four now. So how fast would they do the mile? <laughs> yeah, how probably long? they wouldn't make it because. Oh. Those cars at that speed with the way that they set them up uh, for those qualifying laps, those motors would not last more than maybe five or six laps at that speed. Okay. Because what they, what they do, and it's, it's just one of those crazy things in wing car racing, qualifying is done on 16 volts. That's the first thing. The second thing is that those guys never run more than one flying lap at a time. They will put the car on in front of them on the on the straightaway, and they will slowly pull away so that it stays in the slot. And then, as they get to the banking, they will absolutely peg the throttle, and they will run one lap. And then, as they go across the, the timer for the second lap, they will let go, and they'll stop. And then the, somebody will pick the car up, throw it over to them. They'll turn around, get some some cold air yeah. or something, blow the motor down, check the braids, etc. And if the time wasn't good enough, they'll put it on and do it again. They have a minute to, to qualify, and they probably never get more than two or three laps in, in that minute. Actual hmm. timed laps, right? It's, it's just, a, it's, a, it's crazy. It's the craziest. So thing those things ever. wouldn't run 52 laps, eh? That's all they basically have to run on a Blue King, 52 laps. 155 foot track, yeah, it would be about. Even less yeah. then. Mm -hmm. But they, they, well, they don't, how, long are they, how long are the races? Then when they're actually, the races themselves are five minutes on, four minutes off, because at the, at the top end, at, in, in the open classes, right, five minutes on, four minutes off. And in those that five lanes? minutes, they'll run 200, 300 laps. Yeah. You know, they run 1,000 laps or more in, a, in, a, in an eight-heat race. And... Um, the four, the four minutes between between lane changes uh, is so that they can change motors because they'll run a, a separate motor and possibly even different tires and definitely different braids for every heat of the race at, at that level. It's crazy. But they're, but they're doing different motors and setups for the actual race than they do for qualifying. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have their qualifying motors and then they'll have their race motors. And they will have at least eight race motors waiting because they have eight heats and they'll run a different motor in every heat. And those mm -hmm. guys have got to the point where they can take a motor out of a car, put a new motor in, get everything set up and get it back on the track, ready to go with new tires and new brakes in under four minutes. And then, on <laughs> and then on top of that, they have at least two guys or three guys helping them because one guy will change the guy's controller over there and two of the other guys will be cleaning and prepping his lane, the next lane that he's going to, you know, oh. because they're allowed to put, they're allowed to put glue and stuff on the lane. And uh, one guy will be cleaning the braids all the way around the track because otherwise the car will stall somewhere or they'll burn the braid out on the car because the, the track braid is dirty. It's, it's nuts. So it's eight it's, cars running for five minutes and then the track is... Shut eight, down cars for four. eight cars running for five minutes, then the tracks shut down for four while they all change to the next lane, and then the what? same guys run. So if somebody's time. prepping the lane and putting glue out there, does how does that affect the next driver on that lane? Oh, it, it's your guy is prepping your lane for the next one for, for you when you go out on that lane. So if you were running red lane as the starting lane, when you finished running red lane, your guys will prep green lane for you because that's your next lane. And, and my the point, guy my who was, on was white that that's what, now going to run on red. His yeah. guys are prepping red lane. Oh, so glue could be taken away, can it? Yeah. 
But yeah, they right. wipe it off when they put it back on all the I time. See. So that it's it's one twenty fourth the size and three eighths the fun. And, and they enjoy it, right? Two or three or four hundred times the price. Oh. It's, it's, wow. That's crazy. So wouldn't uh, like, wouldn't take them too long. What was that? Wouldn't take them too long to do that flying mile. Oh no, the flying mile they'll do in less than a heat, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That generation is sounding better and better all the time. So, so what's happened to the motor in five minutes that they can't continue to use it for the next five? Uh, usually the commutator brushes have burned to the point where the commutator is discolored and the brushes themselves are starting to go. Um, I see. Uh, and the, 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 the coat, they, use, they get a kind of a coating on the, on, on the commutator uh, from the carbon. So yeah. what they'll do is they'll take them out. Sometimes they'll run them again, but if you just take the motor and you run it on low voltage, uh, while very cool, and you run it for a couple of minutes, it actually clears up, and you sometimes get a chance to run it for more than one, for more than one heat. Otherwise, when they're done, then they'll take them, they take the motor apart, and they'll put the, the armature in a in a commutator lathe, and they'll, and they'll give the com cut cut off that. Yeah, just a light skim to. Of course, I've done I've done all of this at, at one tenth scale with a, with an armature that's two inches long, five forty size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have a com lathe. <laughs> yeah, so do I. You got a hoodie? No, pre hoodie. Yeah. Um, I can't actually what remember my I, I might be an Orion one. Yeah, they're not they're it. not a lot different. I mean, you could probably yeah. you could probably modify your your it's Orion. Just a, it's a to, pair of uh, a to pair cut of, a, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't get the V box close enough together. Yeah, oh, to, that's to, true. To get a, a, in, a, in an armature for a slot car. Not that I'm cutting comms for interested in cutting comms for a slot car. I don't <laughs> race in any classes that would allow that. Yeah. Well, that that would that would allow it if they knew about it. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I, I'll tell you what I do. I have done with it, and that's trimming tires. You can yeah. put a you can put a three thirty two axle in there. Uh, put a wheel and tire on the axle that serves as a belt pulley and then put another wheel that you want to cut or tire I should say that you want to cut next to that and of course if you use your grub screw wheels just nip it up and uh, cut it back and forth with the diamond tip well, then it's you, muted. Could put, you could probably put two on and, uh, and cut them all at once well, yeah. yes yeah and the nice thing about that is that then the surface of the tire is not affected by the by the shape of what you're using to cut it. That's right. And that's always the problem with it, with any kind of drum grinder when you're grinding the tire, is if there's any kind of, of uh, flatness problem on the drum, it replicates that as a groove in the tire. Yes. Or a taper. Or a taper for that matter, yeah. Although with a, with a, with a lay, com lathe, you could still do it with a taper if you weren't careful. Well, if yes. the com lathe wasn't properly set yeah. up. Yeah. Go ahead, Big Dan. Uh, Graham, I did the calculations on the uh, the King 155. It'd take about a bit over 34 laps, and even if even if their race laps were three seconds, that would still be under two minutes for the mile. Yeah, there you go. And then, yeah. Speaking of calculations, I did a silly one earlier, but it wasn't quick enough, and that was that um, if Greg does decide to race um, the Back to the Future DeLorean, he needs to avoid 28.16 miles per hour because of 32 scale, that would see him in next year. <laughs> it's fine so long as I don't hook up a little wire for it to catch with electric electricity. Yes, on. yes, you need the lightning in the clock. Point, yes, point, you need point. the lightning in the clock tower too, of course. Yeah. 1.2 1. 1. 1. 2 gigawatts. <laughs> 1. 1.21, I think it was. <laughs> and, and, and the good news is, un unlike the, uh, the real car, your car will start. Yeah, every <laughs> yeah. time. Did you ever read the book? Did you ever read DeLorean's book? He, I have not. John DeLorean wrote a book that was called On a Clear Day You Can See General Motors. Yeah. And um, it was a very interesting book about, the, about the, the, the US auto industry and, of course, partly his whole deal to, uh, to make that car in Ireland. He didn't go into his drug dealing to, to finance it. Uh, 
Oh, well, did, did he, I, I imagine, and he didn't mention Colin Chapman basically designing the darn thing either. Um, that I don't remember. It's many years since I read the book, but it was an interesting book. Yeah. It's funded by the British government, was it not? Kind of, yeah. In Detroit, we refer to those as Irish snowmobiles. <laughs> My favorite was that one of the one of the investors was Johnny Carson, and he got a car, and the damn thing didn't start. Mm. Yeah. I think I heard someone the other week mention that they thought the DeLorean was aluminium. It wasn't. It was all stainless steel, Brushed wasn't it? Stainless steel, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, it, it had a steel, but it had a steel chassis. It was just it was just the body that was stainless yeah. steel. Mm -hmm. So the chassis would rot away, leaving you with a nice, pretty body shell on the yard. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Although you can buy a brand new DeLorean that works now because some chap in Texas bought all the rights, all the dyes, all the parts. Yeah, but the front left wing was the one piece that he hadn't got for years and years and years. Yeah, that's because DeLorean, again, being from General Motors, he never gave all the parts to one single supplier, including the body stampings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the body stamping for the driver's side front fender or wing, as you chaps would call it. That's uh, not the driver's side. You, you, yeah, you've well, got the driver's on the wrong side, you have. Well, that, that's <laughs> where it was smart. The reason that, they, that there are so few of them is because he didn't get paid, and he said, the heck with you, I'm not giving you any product. Ah. And don't forget, and all those dies, too, they were stamping out stainless steel, and you really have to have major, serious uh, dies to do that. My claim to fame on that is that I rode in one at Donington Park. Well, did it get all the way around? Uh, uh, yeah. Wow. The, Re the Renaults, aren't they? The, the engines in them are, Re I think, a Renault. Yep, that's what it is. And then also think about the rear bulkhead right behind the... Right behind the seat. seats, yeah. It's plywood. Ah. <laughs> no word of a lie. There were the, 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 owner, the, the UK branch of the owners club was there. And it was just, uh, they were all in the infield and I was chatting with the one of the owners and uh, it, the time came where they all went and did a parade lap and he just invited me to jump in. So I did. Nice. Well, my connection is I, I actually got to spend some time with uh, Gijaro, the, the designer. designer. Yeah. And he said, uh, it looks nice. And that's about it. <laughs> I did my bit. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah, and he said, John, he said, I thought you were saying you, you had a chance to spend some time with DeLorean, but I was going to ask no, you whether that no, was no, no, no. during his vacation or after. <laughs> In the actual design, yeah, that's right. But he, but he was he was he was really he he was hilarious because he also did the Esprit as well. Yeah, you could see the similarity, see the family resemblance. Yeah. Yes, he, he told it, he was hired by Fiat as a designer at age eighteen. He was just that gifted. And oh. Etel, his, his company, Etel Design, now designs everything from coffee pots to cameras. Amazing chap. I mean, and the nicest person. Uh, it, he said he couldn't speak English because we had a translator. Uh, this was at, at a university that, that we, we, we met, and he understands English. He, I, if you ever go to a, another foreign country, make sure you get a trans. It just gives him time to think about an answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me no Good, speak uh, language. What's that? Sorry. Me no speak any language. Oh, he was he was hilarious, just hilarious. I tried that, John, when I went to London, but I couldn't find one. Ah, well, you, you know what they well, you know what they say. North America and the UK are are you know we're separated by a common language. Mm -hmm. That's right. That was Cheshire, right? <laughs> and of course, John got called out the other week when he offered to translate for the uh, French controller guy. I forgot his name, Mister Kai. <laughs> and of course, and of course, he would be a French speaker because he's in Canada. And I, I, yeah, I, but you know, for, you know, but anybody from France will tell you that Canadian French Canadian folks are like a couple of centuries behind the language. Ah, yeah. For example, you know, we in French, potatoes are pommes de terre, right? I mean, potatoes yes. of the earth. Yeah, uh, Quebec, they're called uh, well, you know, patates. There's no such thing as a patate. Sounds almost Spanish to me. It's not, it's not French, it's Quebecois, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly right, yeah. All right, do there I need to it? We've only got 15 minutes left, and I don't think really we've got a whole lot of time for an official topic. Does anybody have I've, a... got, I've got a show and question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, put on my video, which I haven't had on for most of the evening. 
because I'm in my dressing gown. Do you want to show? <laughs> do you want to show my? Um, do you want to show my Audi SCX? I, I can't actually see myself. There I am. So, what I wanted to ask about was, and I should have taken the body shell off of this to show you, but um, in the hole there for the guide, there's a small plastic insert that's got a wing on it or a tab on it. And wrapped around the um, piece that's inside the body there is a coil spring with two turns. Yep. And that tang um, stretches by opening yep. that, uh, that coil spring. And that's how it gets its self-centering, not having any wires. But the guide blade, which is a snap-in job. Let me get that against the wall. Hopefully you can see some of the detail on that. It's got yep. a tang at the front and a tang at the back. That's the SCX? That's the SCX. Oh, okay, okay. And the tang on the front and back lock into uh, that insert that's in the chassis. Yeah. And it wobbles immensely because there's two rotational... Well, this one doesn't rotate inside that one. It's just that one that rotates. Yep. But the... the I've been measuring the, shank, uh, the, the stem on this, and it's uh, a different dimension from there to there to what it is from front to back. So it's not even round and it's really sloppy, even in the insert that does the rotating. And I wondered if anyone had got any experience of how to make this thing stay 90 degrees to the chassis, basically firming it up, straightening it up and stopping the wobbles. How about a pin guide? <laughs> Good suggestion, but unfortunately I've got to stick with this. I've got to stick with this to fit it into with the because it's standard blueprint. I would glue it in. Well, I did think of gluing it in. It is an obvious easy option, but because of the way the braid goes onto it, which is the traditional scale electric way, there's there's two pieces uh hanging down the back. Can you see the two slots? Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Uh, yeah. And of course those little those little copper legs run on the on the fold on the back of the braid. So that's where yeah. the contact is for the the braid, right? Yeah. If I can't get this out because I've glued it in, I'm never going to be able to replace the braid. So that's the good reason not to glue it in. It's a good I, I, reason I not to glue it with something that won't come apart again. Well, this is the next thing. The only glue I've got that I think might come apart again is something like a. I'm going to use the a brand name Evo Stick. I think the phrase for it might be contact adhesive. Yeah, I would. I was thinking more about stuff like we call Shugu or E6000. Ah, now then, I've heard of those, but I've heard of those because they glue polystyrene without melting it. Is that right? Shugu uh, is basically Shugu uh, and, and it pure and it it uh, evaporates. It's a very rubbery. Is it a bit like? Hot glue, but doesn't go as stiff. Or it's it's like a it's like a really soft hot glue that doesn't need to be heated up. It, it comes up, yes, and then it, it it's chemical just you know evaporates and it, and it shrinks down, but it still stays rubbery. Are are you allowed, uh, Wayne, to put anything on the shaft to make it not wobble? That's what I was going to say. Is maybe some kind of shim of some sort. Yeah. Or, or well, yeah. ideally, I think. A sleeve. Yeah. What was the actual diameter when you measured it? It's oval. It's yeah, oval. But, yeah. But all right. So a, a nice round sleeve uh -huh. that still fits inside of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a, with less. So it's, you're basically filling the gap with material to take up the so, slot. So how big's the, the hole in that piece in the in the in the body in the chassis? I, I can't tell you. I can't remember. It was a few <laughs> days ago. I've been asleep since then. How much slop is there? I mean, would a piece of shrink tubing work? Possibly. The it, it the, the only yes, I had thought of shrink tubing. The only issue with sleeving this Good stem idea. is the fact that it's bigger at the top, and anything that's going to fit round the um, fit round the body of it or the the neck, the main neck, is going to have to fit over this. I mean, there's only just a tiny little slot in it for it to squeeze in and just pop into place as it pops up through the hole. You could, you but could you're spend, right. You, you could spend uh, 600 pounds on a 3D printer to make something. Uh, can't do that. Got to use standard that, equipment. Remember that, that slot is as much for compression and holding it in as it is to hold that spring to keep. Uh, that's right. It's oh. just a, it just clicks in like the old-fashioned electric blade did. Gotcha. Uh, what, Wayne? Uh, 
model aircraft industry have, have a number of little um, collars that are fixed by a grub screw, whether you could find one of those that, that would fit over the thing. Well, I... That would probably be too big. Too big, I think. I think I thought K&S brass tubing from the metal centre in the model shop. I'm thinking... But I'm thinking it still won't go tape. over the top. <laughs> just, just wrap some cello tape around it. Well, hold on. So Wayne, if you could take the uh, K&S an brass of the, of the, and... and Cut it to split it, yeah, yeah. And split it and then put it around. It might work. Yeah, or you could do that with and also close it back place, up. right? Or try that with play struck styrene, and that might snap around and that may make up the slop as well. So, we're talking styrene tubes. I, I mean, I've got a drinking straw to try and play with, but it's yeah, and, it's, and, sl and slip the side so that you can get it around, yeah. right. The, the straw is just far too big diameter, so I don't right, I need right, to right. go, but that's but that's kind of the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. Split the side, so, yes, wrap it around, pop, pop it in and see whether or not I've got too much friction. Well, I won't have too much friction because it doesn't, this is not the friction surface. Yeah, right. it's not, it's yeah not you'll be fine. fine. Yeah. Yeah, so all I need to do yeah. is tighten it up. Yeah. A, a, a lot of the old 1960s guides used a collar to fix them. Um, I'm sure that... Yeah. Oh, you mean a, a collar on the, around the top from the, 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 the bit that's poking yeah. through the top? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I've got another. I've got. Get, yeah. Go on, I, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, well, 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 whether you could get a hold, you know, so, someone in the vintage fraternity that's got old guys with old collars that go to them, whether they could find something about the size that'd fit over the the top of you. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it's bigger than a model aero collar. I've, I'm familiar with the model yeah. aero collar. It's there for uh, attaching two push rods side by side. Put the uh -huh. collar over. Stick the grub screw in hard and basically trap two rods to make a push rod that's adjustable and those tend to have a hole in them that's probably two and a half three millimeters but i think i think that's that won't go but the thing around. is too when, when that's clipped in it's you've only got just that those little extensions at the top of the post that are protruding out through the top that's correct there would These be two. no space to put a collar on there that's right it's very little yeah, i have I got one idea that no one's mentioned and that is to get a grub screw that's quite long to M2, and I've already had one in, screw it all the way down the center of the stem. I found out that the, by pin probing that the stem, the hole in the stem ends at the top of the guide. So I can, I've got enough, I can actually strengthen the post by sticking a grub screw in. It didn't spread it, it didn't make it any larger, but if I stick a grub screw in and then I pop a small tube over the, when it's uh, install it in the car, then pop a small tube over the outside and then put a nut down the M2 thread. That will have the, serve the purpose of pulling it up into the chassis and hopefully stabilize it. I haven't built it yet, but that's one of the thoughts that I've come up with. The other way would be to put, use a slightly bigger than M2 grub screw and just expand it like a 2.5. Yeah, the, the trouble with it expanding is it's not got enough slot in it to really expand in the main body you know what i mean the slot is only i'm going to take a yeah. good guess yeah, yeah, yeah. okay millimeter half two millimeters so it's a wayne sorry to interrupt does the top sort of wider bit have to be there i would say so although what where because if you can remove that then you can actually do something with the shaft that's yeah, correct just put a washer on a washer and a screw down yeah yeah, that's but right. And, and it would pull up. That'll disable the self-centering. No, because... Uh, no, the, it won't no, be tight. Because it, that piece doesn't rotate. It's the piece in the car that's rotating. Okay, I'm thinking of the type that has... The, 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 the Good point, John. That goes around the spring, and the spring in the slot is what centers it. So all I've done with the car, since I showed it to you a couple of weeks ago, is... Get the body shell to float on the on the chassis. That's I don't know if you can see it, but there's about a millimeter of about a millimeter of movement. Wayne, yeah. is there enough of that stem exposed through the chassis that you could maybe do like a wrap of wire just to, to pull it up tight from the bottom, almost like a safety wire type situation? I, or? I know what you mean, like a lock wire, like a scrutiny yeah. I might use. Uh, I don't know. I'll get me I'll get me a little Phillips and I'll take the body off. We'll have another look at it from inside if you're that. If you're that interested, let, just give me a moment. I'll get a little screw I do have one other possible solution, and that's just buy this car. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
What is it? I can't it's see. A <laughs> Buy your one. <laughs> what have you? What be your guy? Oh, ah, yeah, you've got you've got the. Uh, <laughs> the, the The other thing I've done from time to time with those that have got the open top is to get a, a piece of uh, bronzing rod or piano wire and just put it in, in the slot at the top with that exposed bit where the little lugs come out and then just glue that or shoe glue in and uh, and it sort of stops it. It pushes down a bit and it stops it from wobbling sideways. Well, I was hoping that by having a tube that fits over the whole thing on the outside up above, that the diameter of the tube being quite large would also prevent the wobble. That's what I'm going to try and do first, and I haven't found a tube. That's the What's answer. What's the issue that this is actually causing? Just a sloppy guide. Just a sloppy guide, and it's as you know, as you go into a corner, the guide turn rolls over somewhat, and then it wants to any any side load on that guide or speed in the car makes it want to ramp up and makes it want to slide out up the slot. So there we go. Can you see? Can you see or can you not? Not yeah. as well as you can. Yeah. Tell us what you're looking at. Uh, this is the little spinny thing. It's got a wing here and a wing opposite. And those two come around to meet this pin at the front. And that's your guide rotation limits. Okay. And if I can actuate it. We learn all these new technical terms every week. <laughs> Spinny I, thing. I remember spinny that. Spinny thingy. Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah, I can see how it returns there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you might not see the spring, but it's wrapped around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can see how it returns, Wayne. Yeah, we can see that. You must have better screens than my camera, because <laughs> even I'm struggling to see it on screen. <laughs> but the height, um, can you see? Yeah, can it's not very much there. Yeah, well, okay, now, I'm, but the, theoretically, if you get uh, a, a, like some sort of sheath in that round space on, on, on the um, uh, chassis, that top of that guide should click through just like it does now, it, it, because you're not talking about a, a, a huge amount of space, right? Well, these, the funny thing is that no matter what I do with the, with the thing from up top, I'm going to start to lose this feature. It, that might that not be a bad. That might not be a bad thing. I mean, look how much it moves. Yeah, wobble. that's what I'm saying. It, it might not be a bad thing if you lose that. You want it to be stable. Yeah, I, but it's going to come all the way up, and that means I'm going to need very, very small front wheels and tires, and they look ridiculous in the arch. Well, you, you've got a lathe. Yes, I can make the wheels and tires. That's not a problem. You can actually spot the guide popping up out the front there, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of movement. So a lot what of you movement, need to yeah. do then is put a washer underneath to stop that movement up. So you would put normally pop a washer on on there. Yeah. But look at the tang. Thing. Look at the tangs it's got. Remember that those tangs interlock with the spinny bit in the it's chassis. The oh, it's yeah. Oh, right. So I can't. I can't shim this guy down because it needs to interlock. It's a lot of different little challenges that you all need thinking about. Pick so a what movement <laughs> don't you like? The sideways movement or oh, the up? Uh, I'll show you the movements I don't like. I did do I did do this uh, with yeah. the whole car. It's it's this one. Oh yeah, you don't yeah. want that. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a horizontal movement. And I think I just demonstrated this one where the Oh, yeah, that's not... That's actually tipping back and forward. It's not rotating. No, this is a great example of something that's really over-engineered for no reason. Absolutely. Look at that. They didn't do it for competition. They did it for ease of maintenance, you know? Yeah, they, they did it for... It out or broken, you just pop it out and pop in a new one. Pull that out, fit a new one. It would probably be supplied with braids. I've never tried to buy one, but the braids are... Correct. They they're copper, but they're stiff. It, it was generally sold as a as a whole unit with the braids on. I mean, you could buy braid from SCX separately, of course, but when you yeah. buy guides, it comes with the braid on it. So all you do is yeah, buy yeah. a guide, you Very braid simple. guide, or worry off the braids, you just pop a new one in. Yeah. Put the car apart. Greg, if I could just quickly uh, yeah, de demonstrate what I was saying uh, a little while ago. 
this this isn't an SCX guide. That's uh, the old scale electric, is it not? Yeah, that's it. Here's here's your pretend bit of uh, rod, and you just yeah. put it down in there. Yeah, and and fix, to spread and it. Fix it. You either spread it, or it locks in against the top of the moulding so that it can't go that way. I, mean, I got yeah. Just, I'll give it outriggers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a possibility. If I wonder if there's anything on the chassis that it could sit it could sit on. There, there are. Actually, yeah. Dan, that's a that's a pretty elegant solution. That's that's not a bad idea. The body posts are. I can't see myself again. <laughs> well, don't worry yeah. about it. You're going to do some experimenting. We're at our two hour mark. Oh yeah, yeah. Good. You guys, of course, can continue with this conversation, uh, and hopefully, people who are watching will come and join us next week. And until then, we'll say goodbye. Bye. Bye.